life and stories for empty people is every campfire they need a circle darkest skies are the most peaceful is every great storm it needs an equal as one more ship has passed one more failed romance one more second chance for this evening last thing that you need is one more great defeat crawl back to your knees for the weak and for the weak and drink to you your drink to me oh glide glide i'll drink to you your drink to me oh glide glide writers in need of healing as all great fighters they need a meaning as one more ship has passed one more failed romance one more second chance for this evening last thing that you need is one more great defeat crawl back to your knees for the weak and for the weak and drink to you your drink to me oh, glide glide drink to you your drink to me one more ship has passed one more failed romance one more second chance for this evening last thing that you need is one more great defeat crawl back to your knees for the weak and for the weak and drink to you your drink to me oh glide Glide, drink to you, your drink to me. Oh, glide, glide. Thank you very much. Cheers, folks. Quick reprise the program and the manipulation of perception puts people on the postage stamp consensus, and the idea is to stay there for life. Um, and what you hear all the time is, uh, you hear scientists say this, and, and you hear 24-hour you hear news presenters say this. They say, okay, uh, what we know is, about some breaking story, when, and then they, what they do when they say what we know is, is they tell you what they've been told um, is going on, but it's not necessarily the truth. And so when you hear scientists say um, what we know is, well, it's only what they think they know at that point. It's not necessarily true. For instance, um, until the 1920s, mainstream science thought there was one galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. Now they reckon there's between 100 and 500 billion, depending who you talk to, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the known universe. So whatever people think they know at any point is only what they think they know. And this is the, where we get to... Um, 
what uh, Socrates said in ancient Greece, or supposed to have done, wisdom is knowing how little we know, because your mind's always open. So this whole section is about this. How do we get there, the mass control of human perception, we suppress knowledge of self and reality. We keep from people the very nature of who they are and the very nature of the reality they're experiencing. So that way, they're in such a, such a fog of misunderstanding of the world that we are experiencing that they'll never get what, what's going on um, in, um, in relation to the world they think they live in. So we're going into this other level of the rabbit hole now, the next one down which is reality is an illusion. When I mean that is physical reality as we experience is an illusion. What if all you ever knew was a lie? It sounds like an incredible question, but actually it's basically true. Um, and uh, Leonardo da Vinci said, all great acts of genius began with the same consideration. Do not be constrained by your present reality. But the postage stamp consensus and its program is there to make sure we are constrained by our present reality, which main, remains our reality our entire lives. You mean it's not real? Well, in terms of physicality, solidity, no, it's not real. That's the scale of the illusion that we're experiencing. And if you can hold people in a belief that it is, then you've already got them in a tiny, tiny perception of reality from which you can play them like a violin, which is what happens. Um, Consider that you can see less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum and hear less than 1% of the acoustic spectrum. 90% of the cells in your body carry their own microbial DNA and are not you. The atoms in your body are 99.9999999% etc. empty space and none of them were the ones you were born with. Human beings have 46 chromosomes, two less than a potato. The, the exister, George Bush, I rest my case. <laughs> um, how f uh, when you look at Trump, how far are we really away from a potato being elected president of the United States? How far? It can't be long. And if he did get elected, I suppose he'd have his ships quite early on, wouldn't he? <laughs> anyway, off, don't start me. Uh, the uh, existence of the rainbow depends on the conical photoreceptors in your eyes. To animals without cones, the rainbow does not exist. So you don't just look at a rainbow, you create it. This is pretty amazing, especially considering that all the beautiful colors you see represent less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is from a mainstream magazine, science magazine, called Wonderpedia magazine. Every second, 11 million sensations, bits of information, crackle along these brain pathways. The brain is confronted with an alarming array of images, sounds, and smells, which it rigorously filters down until it is left with a manageable list of around 40. Thus, 40 sensations per second out of 11 million make up what we perceive as reality. What do they say? What we know is... Yeah, okay. And uh, this um, 13th century Sufi mystic, Rumi, said, this place is a dream. Only a sleeper considers it real. Then death comes like dawn and you wake up laughing at what you thought was your grief. And what keeps us from this understanding, and so much more that I'll get into now, is the perception we call the real world, which is the completely and utterly unreal world. And we're basically given a fake choice between God and non-existence. Either you um, are subject to some, some God imposing its will upon you, or life's a bitch and then you die and the lights go out. And that's the end of it. That's the kind of choice. But there is another one, that we are a state of awareness, a state of being aware and we can be that aware or we can be infinitely aware. It's a choice of how aware we choose to open our minds to be or open our consciousness to be. A state of being aware. And this is a quote from a Central American shaman. You know, one of those primitive people. Doesn't know what he's talking about compared with a professor at, at uh, university. Anyway, 
I'll just pass it on, you know, just to pass it on, you know, you know what these primitive people are like. He said, um, we are perceivers, we are awareness, we are not objects, we have no solidity, we are boundless, we or rather our reason forget this, and thus we entrap the totality of ourselves in a vicious circle from which we rarely emerge in our lifetime. And that vicious circle is what the program is there to stop us emerging from. We are all one. We hear this all the time. We are one. I agree, but what does it mean? I suggest it means that we are all points of attention within one infinite awareness. And you can have different points of attention having different experiences. The trick is to see them as experiences of that point of attention and not confuse them with the nature of who we are rather than what we are experiencing. And uh, this is a near-death experiencer called Nita Mujani, the uh, author of a book called Dying to Be Me, who said, when we are not expressing in our physical body, you and I and all of us, we are all expressions of the same consciousness. I completely agree. I've been saying it for decades and decades, and yet I'm a racist, <laughs> even though I am saying we are all one and the body is just an experience. I am you. You are me. We are looking at ourselves through different points of attention. Same consciousness, different color vehicle, end of story. And if we get um, obsessed with the vehicle and self-identify it, then we can get divided and ruled, and then we think of ourselves in terms of limitation, and I can't. You are not what is in your skin. You are what is in your heart. Everything else is just detail. So, we are points of attention with infinite awareness. And that point of attention can take us back and encompass vast amounts of awareness, inspiration, insight beyond the world of the seen. Or it can lock us totally in to the world of the apparent seen. And all we are perceiving is the world of the five senses. And we are like, in form, we are like the crest of a wave in an ocean. The crest of a wave looks different. It's the white uh, froth of the wave. But it's still the same ocean. It's just a different expression of it. That's what we are, different expressions of the same infinite uh, state of awareness. And you know, when I was a kid, they, they said to me, um, this is the Atlantic Ocean, that specific ocean, that's the Indian Ocean. And I used to think, I thought, it's all the same water. Um, and what they do is give it different names, even though it's all the same water. Now, we understand that, so you know what part of the water you're talking about. But we, are, we give different names. Fred Jones, you know, Bill Smith, to different parts of the same Awareness of which we are all points of attention. And that point of attention can be all or a tiny fragment. Um, the ocean is the droplet. The droplet is the ocean. The, when you hold a, a, a droplet of water in your hand, it looks to be isolated. It looks to be apart from everything else. But you drop it in the ocean. Where does the droplet end and the ocean start? They are all the same uh, water. And the, this is the bottom line of this whole conspiracy to enslave human perception. To disconnect the droplet, five cents mind, from the ocean. Five cents mind from infinite awareness. Once that's done, we're in trouble. As uh, Leonard Cohen said, if you don't become the ocean, you'll be seasick all your life. And this sense of of, of, of longing, this sense of disconnection, this sense of isolation that so many people feel, and they think it's about their life in this reality, it's really about the disconnection they're feeling from the true self, the infinite self, which is what this program is all about creating. The system says you are insignificant, you have no power. The truth is you are all that is and ever can be. And this is how, this is the gap that the system wants to put in. So we see ourselves in those terms and not those terms, because then it's over. 
So little me, oh, I'm just little me. Oh, God. There's no little me. It doesn't exist except as a perception. And our perception of little me uh, manifests itself, for reasons I'll come to, into an experience of little me. But it's the perception that creates the experience. There is no little me unless we believe in it. We are infinite awareness experiencing itself in infinite uh, ways. And we are all the same consciousness having those experiences. And all the different um, ancient and native cultures around the world all have different names for this force that I'm talking about. One of them, the, the Lakota, uh, call it Wakantanka, the force which moves all things. It's the, the life force. It is the, um, the force we call consciousness. And it is everywhere, and it is um, working through everything. How much of that consciousness we let in dictates how aware we are of our experience and our reality. New science revelations. Trees communicate with each other and have social circles. Everything is conscious. Stunned scientists discover that plants learn like humans and intelligently adapt to their environments. Are plants conscious? Answer, everything is conscious. This is what we lose. Inanimate objects have a form of consciousness. Um, it's all the way through the ages, this has been a theme. Everything is alive, everything is interconnected. Leonardo da Vinci, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else because everything is everything else, ultimately, at the level of consciousness. William Blake, who's a deep esoteric thinker, um, a, uh, a brilliant painter, artist, and poet, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it really is infinite. And the program is there to make sure that those doors of perception are never cleansed. Nikola Tesla, my brain is only a receiver. In the universe, there is a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. I have not penetrated into the secrets of this core, but I know it exists. This core, I uh, reached a point some years ago, about two, well, it was 2003, where I thought, uh, if I'm really going to get a, a greater understanding of this reality that that, that we're experiencing, and thus understand it more. I've got to get out there in a way and look at, look at it from another point of view in a way that's not a dream. Not a dream where you wake up and you think, you know, did, was that real? Did that happen? But where I'm consciously experiencing it. Synchronistically, very soon after that, I got an invitation to go to the rainforest of Brazil near a place called Manaus, about an hour and a half's drive away. Uh, and partake of something called um, ayahuasca, which is the, um, the only time I've taken psychoactive drugs. It's a rain, rainforest plant. And, and I took this over two nights. Could have taken it for four. Two was enough for me. And, and I've, I've not had the, 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 uh, really the, the feeling to do it again. But I had a two fantastic nights. Some people have a bad, bad time. I had a fantastic time. But on the second night, for five hours, I um, had this voice talking to me once I went into an altered state. Uh, took a female form, as loud as mine is now, and for five hours it uh, described to me the illusory nature of physical reality. And it was, I mean, the hardest thing in that five hours was me belly, because I laughed and laughed and laughed, because uh, it was pointing out all the things we believe to be real and what they really are. It was hilarious. And I went back to England and started looking at different scientific disciplines and all that stuff, and I realized that if you put the dots together, the evidence is always already there to show that what I was told in that ayahuasca uh, altered state is absolutely the reality that we are experiencing. And when I um, started going into this altered state, it takes about an hour, what, what happens is you, 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 when you open your eyes, the world looks like this, but your eyes don't want to stay open. They want to close. And when they close, woo, you're somewhere else. Um, and this voice said to me, first of all, um, we're going to take you to where you come from and to where you will return so that you can better understand where you are. And um, I, I saw this, this, I can always call it as a, 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 a brilliant darkness. 
It was dark, but it was shimmering brightly. And um, the voice said to me, all you really need to know, this is how it started out, is infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. Infinite love is the base state of existence. And everything else is an illusion that we we allow to disconnect us from that state of infinite love. I don't mean infinite love in the state of I love you, darling, saw you down the, saw you down the, the disco. Do they still have discos? I'm sure I'm the age, and I? Um, I mean, uh, uh, um, a love that's beyond that. We have to say things like infinite love to, to try to give it a feel for, for how love has become um, misunderstood. And um, we'll go back here quickly, because I'm going to come to that in a second. Go back, go back one more. Now, after that, I um, saw this and experienced this. It looked something like that. And this voice said, this is the infinite in awareness of itself. Everything is infinite awareness, but not everything is infinitely aware. This is the, the level of that awareness, which is aware of what it is. It doesn't think it's Ethel on the checkout. It doesn't think it's Bill driving a bus. Their experiences. It knows what it is. All that is, has been, and ever can be. And out of this comes all what you might call creation, all form, all experience. And um, it's, uh, I experienced it as something that didn't move. It was still, but maybe very slowly moving. It was virtually still, and it was silent. Um, and um, a while later, I came across this book, quite a while later, a book by a guy called Eben Alexander called Proof of Heaven. And Eben Alexander is a, an American uh, neurosurgeon who, he believed that this was real. He believed that consciousness is in the brain, and when the brain dies, it's all over. His father did, and he inherited it. It's the program again. And then one day, he went into a coma for seven days, and almost the entirety of his brain uh, shut down. He um, should never have survived, but he did. And when he came back after seven days, he, he, he didn't see the world like that anymore because of what he'd experienced. And he says in the book, um, during my seven days of coma, I not only remained fully conscious, but journeyed to a stunning world of beauty and peace and unconditional love, my consciousness traveling to another level. That's what exists beyond the world that we see. He talked then, this is the bit that hit me, he talked about experiencing the core, which is what Tesla called it, or the dazzling darkness from where the purest love emanated and where all was known. The dazzling darkness describes precisely what I experienced in that ayahuasca state, from where everything comes. This uh, infinite awareness, in awareness of itself, is all that is and ever can be. And all that has been. Now that seems extraordinary. You can't be all that is and ever can be, um, but you can because what we're looking at here is a state of all possibility. This is what this infinite awareness and awareness of itself is. It's a state of all possibility. Anything can manifest from it, and thus there are no contradictions because all possibility means all possibility. And it means all potential for creation, manifestation, experience. So in that state of awareness, that all possibility has to be everywhere and it has to be nowhere. Because they are both possibilities. It has to be everything while at the same time being nothing because they are both infinite possibilities. And people talk about the no-thing, the nothing, like uh, as if um, nothing exists. If it's not moving, if it's not making a noise, if one of the five senses can't attach to it, then it can't exist. The no-thing, oh, that's nothing. Um, but as I said, I experienced that dazzling darkness as silence and stillness. Because in the no-thing is everything, because it's all possibility. And so um, from that state of potential come various 
infinite worlds of what we call form, call form, which are basically frequency bands of reality interpenetrating each other like the old analog radio stations interpenetrate each other in the same space but never interfere with each other unless they're really close on the dial even though they share the sp same space. And in the space, what we call space, that's another illusion, um, that I'm standing in now is all that is, has been, and ever can be. Endless other worlds and areas of experience, all sharing the same space that we're sharing now, only on different frequencies. Thus, we cannot see them and do not perceive them, although we can if they're close on the dial, and we call things like that ghosts and the paranormal. The voice said to me in, in, um, in Brazil, if it vibrates, it's illusion, because the state of infinite awareness and awareness of itself is, is not in a state of vibration, it's a state of stillness, silence, it's all possibility waiting to manifest. And Albert Einstein said of the world of frequency, the world of form, the world of manifestation, everything is energy and that's all there is to it. Match the frequency of the reality you want and you can't help but get that reality. That can be no other way. This is not philosophy, this is physics. And so, while we are experiencing this reality, we can operate on a frequency band that locks us only in to this reality. And that's five sense mind experiencing a five sense world and that's all it knows. Or, while in the same stroke or quote form, we can connect with all that is, has been and ever can be, that, that state of all potential, all possibility, and we can manifest that in this reality which vastly increases our potential for uh, what we can experience, what we can create, all of it, than if we hold ourselves in this low vibrational state, which again is what the program is there for. Because if you go deeper, deep enough into this, uh, this web, you find a point where they understand how this works and they're using it to control us. So we have a visible universe and we have an invisible universe. The visible universe, this, is absolutely tiny in terms of the range of frequency that we can see. It's laughable. Almost the entirety of this universe and beyond this universe, the entirety of forever is denied to us. We can't see it. We're, what we know is, I love it. Um, we have higher frequencies, what some people call densities, and we have lower frequencies and densities, and we are living in one of them. We are not living in a world, as I'll come to as we go through this section, we're living in a band of frequency that we perceive to be a world. And beyond it is infinity, infinity of experience, of creation, of, 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 of endless different realities and ways of experiencing. And they're all denied to us because of the way we um, decode reality. And this frequency band is tiny. According to uh, mainstream science, uh, they talk about dark energy and dark matter. I don't buy that at all. So I'm using the terms the hidden and, and, uh, and the seen. Um, according to mainstream science, the electromagnetic spectrum is 0.005% of what exists in what they call the known universe. 0.005%. Everything else is outside the electromagnetic spectrum. But it gets funnier because visible light, which is the only frequency band that we can see, is a tiny fraction of the 0.005% of the electromagnetic spectrum. We have been locked into a frequency band of perception so ludicrously small, I would suggest, and I'll come to in part three, it's not by accident. No wonder we don't understand what's going on when we can see a, a smear of what there is to see. This is um, a near-death experiencer. Again, Anita Mojani. There's so much more that exists simultaneously and alongside things that you can see. You know that just because you cannot see them, you can't experience it 
doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But these near-death experiences know that it does. But the postage stamp consensus is telling us all the time that if you can't see it, touch it, taste it, that it doesn't exist. And that's why the postage stamp consensus is the village idiot that is not there to um, open our minds to the true nature of reality, but to hold our minds closed to the true, new, true uh, nature of reality so we can be controlled through ignorance. So Anissa Mojani, um, she had this concept, and it's an excellent one. She said, um, when you're in the body, it's like you're in a vast black, jet black warehouse, and you're holding a torch, and all you can see is whatever is within the tiny band of the torch. Everywhere else is so dark you can't see it. She said, and when you leave the body, when the point of awareness, the point of attention leaves the body, the vehicle that is holding that attention in this reality, then it's like someone turns on the lights of the warehouse and you realize that you've actually been experiencing the tiniest, tiniest fraction of what there is to see and there is to know and what exists. She said, a realm, this expanded realm outside of the body is a realm of clarity where I understood everything. I felt connected to everybody. Why? Because that point of attention went into a level of the uh, infinite awareness, infinite consciousness without the filter of the body where everything is everything else because it's all one consciousness having different experiences. Now, um, we might talk about infinite awareness, but like I say, it doesn't mean that everything and everyone is infinitely aware. You can have a, 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 a massive crashing, um, pulsating ocean of water, and you can have a block of ice also made of water. It's the same substance, it's in a different state. And so we're looking at levels in awareness and consciousness that are in different states. Um, and the whole point of the, the program, the conspiracy, is to hold people in a state of five sense awareness, to hold that focus of attention so that we are not, no, not only not aware, but not influenced by the greater self beyond the five sense point of attention. Alan Watts, who, I, who was on that video earlier, the ego is nothing other than the focus of attention. What he calls the ego, I call phantom self. So we are imprisoned by our point of attention, our sense of reality, and that's what the program is all about, holding that attention. So if we go through life with all these influences to hold our perception in the narrowest band possible, then we're going to go from cradle to grave, and we're not going to suss what's going on. We're not going to understand what's going on. We're just going to believe what we're told and then leave. Um, that is the revolution. People talk about, well, we can stockpile weapons for a revolution. <laughs> Change anything. The revolution is a revolution of perception, a revolution of expanding our, our awareness and our perception, our self-identity. From little me to infinite me, and everything changes, everything changes, because we start creating a different reality based on a different perception of reality. No more little me, no more experience of little me. No more I have no power, no more experience of I have no power. Look, there's infinite awareness. I can't see it. That's basically what's going on between those who've awakened to it and those who haven't. And when you study um, the experiences of near-death experiences, can be fascinating. I've, I've read endlessly about them over the years, um, and millions of people have had this experience of leaving the body and experience a completely different reality. Um, this is a, a, a mainstream scientific um, story about quantum theory proving consciousness moves to another universe after death. Um, well, you, you, I mean, it, it, it's amazing what science can come up with, given that shamans and ancient peoples have been saying it for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and this is a a near-death experience, um, a near-death experiencer that encapsulates everything that I'm saying here. He said that when he left the body, everything from the beginning, my birth, my ancestors, my children, my wife, everything comes together simultaneously. 
I saw everything about me and about everyone who was around me. I saw everything they were thinking now, what they thought then, what was happening before, what was happening now. There is no time, there is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. All of those things, he says, that weren't there, appear to be here because we are, we are decoding a program, as I'll get to. And even Alexander said in his book, to experience thinking outside the brain is to enter a world of instantaneous connections that make ordinary thinking, those aspects limited by the physical brain and the speed of light, seem like some hopelessly sleepy and plodding event. Our truest, deepest self is completely free. It is not crippled or compromised by past actions or concern with identity or status. It comprehends that it has no need to fear the earthly world, and therefore it has no need to build itself up through fame or wealth or conquest. And as long as they can hold us into the belief that that is what life is about, they'll keep us in a state of ignorance and disconnection from the true self beyond it. As one near death experiencer said, it's like being half asleep when I was alive and totally awake when I was pronounced dead. So we can be our body, we can self-identify with that, we can be phantom self, and we will have a certain experience and a certain perception of reality. Or we can choose to self-identify as all that is and ever can be, having that experience, and everything changes. Everything changes. No more little me then. No more uh, only seeing the dots then. Then the tapestry. Then the pixels become the pictures. And if we come into this frequency band we call the world, and we hold that connection to expanded self beyond the program, beyond the illusion, then we've got everything we need. We can, uh, we can interact with this reality, and we can see information and have experience within this reality, but we've also got connection to outside this reality, outside the program, giving us another point of reference, another way of observing the world, seeing the world, seeing how the dots connect instead of only seeing them apart. But if you lose that connection, and this is what the program is about and the whole way society is structured, if you lose that connection, that influence, you become in this world and of it. That's in this world, but not of it. This is in this world and of it, which is where most people are because of the program. And once you're isolated from that other point of reference, you've got one place to look to get a grip uh, um, and, and a, a fix on the world that you're in and the nature of your own self. And that is here, as we perceive it. And what comes back the other way? The education system, the scientific institutions, the mainstream media, peer pressure. And that's why we get lost in this illusion of isolation and disconnection. And this is the inversion again. When you can start to connect with a greater expanded awareness and you get a greater fix on the world and you start to see the world in a different way, this reality calls you mad. You're mad, you are. I've been calling me mad for 30 years. You're mad. You're crazy. No, and when you're in this world and of it, and not seeing beyond it, then you're called sane. Because we're back to the madhouse, thinking madness is normal. So the whole point of the conspiracy is trapping attention within five sense reality and selling us a label of self or an I am ma. Uh, I am ma, uh, my race. Name, uh, job, income bracket, religion, and life story. That's who I am. No, that is what we are experiencing. And the idea, I mean, this, is, this analogy is very, very accurate, I would suggest. The body is like a computer. I've call, been calling it for a long time a biological computer. It's actually a, 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 an energetic computer as uh, a well in its base state. But anyway, that is like the computer on the desktop. It is, as the computer locks us into the internet, the World Wide Web, it is a means of experiencing this reality. But the person on 
The desk with the mouse and the keyboard is dictating the experience. Where you go on the internet, what you think of it. Once the computer becomes the five sense mind, becomes disconnected from expanded awareness, then basically it's the computer and the perceptions of the computer that are deciding what we think of it and where we're going. And therefore we become confused. We don't know what's going on because we've got no other point of reference except the one that we have in front of our eyes called the five sense mind, five sense reality. And so it's like disconnecting the thinker from the knower. The thinker thinks because they don't know. So they're trying to work it out. The brain thinks, he's trying to work it out. But when you come into in the intuitive level of knowing, which is the connection to the greater self, you don't think with your heart, you don't think with your intuition, you know with your intuition, and you know because you're connecting into that level that does know. And yet, this world is always telling you, go with your head, not with your heart. Go with your head, not your intuition. And the brain thinks the heart, this heart center, this heart vortex center, knows, and they want to put us in there, particularly in the left side of there, and then they got us. Uh, Einstein said, I never made one of my discoveries through the process of rational thinking. No. Because to, 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 to get the inspiration for, for great discoveries beyond the program, you have to go beyond the program. You have to open your mind to go into levels of awareness beyond the program. And that's where you get the inspiration that the program does not provide. It's where all the great creative minds have gone. And we have this thing called rational. Being rational, you've got to be rational. Um, if you're not rational, you're, you're, you're not normal, you're, you're crazy, you're a bit strange. So we're going to go on a little, um, a little journey of word definitions from rational and see where we go. Because rational thinking is the program thinking, even though we're told it's high intelligence thinking, inversion. The definition of rational is something based on or agreeable to reason. So we've gone from rational to reason. Reason is defined as to determine or conclude by logical thinking. So rational to reason to logical. And logic is a system of reasoning. We've come back to reasoning now. We're going round and round in this word search. And then we come to reason again which is described as a normal mental state sanity. But a normal mental state sanity, according to what? According to the madhouse. The madhouse's point of reference, point of perception, is dictating these words that are used to decide if we are intelligent, if we are credible, if we are... Um, normal. And yet, it's just a perceptual illusion of the madhouse. All these things like reason, what do they mean? Nothing. We need to go beyond reason, beyond rational, into the realms of how it all really works. And if you take that, that bubble program I talked about earlier, that is basically what disconnects the computer the five sense mind from wider consciousness is the focus of attention and the perceptions that come from that perceptual download from Cradle to Grave that I was talking about. And so, or even though we are all that is, has been, and ever can be, we say, I'm Billy, I'm Ethel, I'm John. I am little me. I am phantom me. I have no power, because at that level everything seems limited, everything like, seems I can't. And how appropriate it is that the word person comes from persona, which is Latin for actor's mask. That's what the phantom self is. The experiencing self we take to be the real self. It is an actor's mask which we believe to be real. It's not real. It's an illusion. We need to break if we're going to have, be free of this manipulated world. I know exactly where I am. That's the idea we're supposed to believe in, even though we don't. Everyone knows that, mate. 
because everyone's connected to the same program. It doesn't mean ev what everyone knows is true. Usually isn't. And the postage stamp consensus imposes itself on all these institutions and delivers the, the package of perceptions that most people go through their lives believing in. And <clears throat> the reality we're experiencing that is holding us in this servitude is basically a virtual reality I have seen over the last 30 years, a virtual reality universe. And what's brilliant now, uh, you know, the, the old shamans of the past, they had to, to uh, try to explain these concepts with the, the tools and symbols of the day that they had. Very difficult, often. Um, but we are getting closer and closer with technological reality to the reality we're actually experiencing. And so it's much easier to explain the concepts. Uh, Einstein said, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a persistent one. And it's persistent because we are constantly decoding an information source which manifests as the world that we are all experiencing. Just like a, uh, a computer uh, decoding a video game or a computer game. And what we're seeing now more and more, and we ain't far away from it, is these video games are getting closer and closer to the reality that we're actually experiencing in terms of their, uh, their uh, believability. And it won't be long, these cutting edge people in this area say, before you won't be able to tell the difference between computer game reality and this reality. Why? Because the, 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 the theme is basically the same. More and more, we're seeing people in virtual reality getting closer and closer to the, looking like the people in our reality. Here's another one with this guy. Um, and it's so powerful on the perceptual decoding systems of the brain that burns units in some hospitals are putting people onto virtual reality while they're having uh, dressings changed because um, the brain is taken into another reality, and therefore the pain of the dressings in this reality is far less. This is the impact upon the brain. Now, when we look at computer games, especially these more sophisticated ones with the gloves and the, the goggles and the audio, we're looking at a hack by the video game into the very decoding processes that we manifest or through which we manifest this reality. Um, the gloves are feeding information to the, the, uh, the feeling senses um, and to the sight senses with the, with the, uh, the headset and the, the ears, etc. And they are overriding the normal information that we're receiving and decoding and manifesting as this reality. They're overriding it. And it can be so, and so the brain is decoding a different reality coming from the information of the computer game. And it can be so amazingly vivid and real when, when people are on these games because of the way their normal reality has been overridden by one that seems to be so real as well. So we are living in a quantum computer universe, I would suggest, which is defined, a, a quantum computer, as a computer that makes use of the quantum states of electrons and other particles to store and process information. In short, a quantum computer stores its information in the energetic fabric of the computer itself. And therefore, we're living in a, a universe, a reality, in which the information we're decoding is stored in the energetic fabric we are interacting with all the time. Uh, Scientific American magazine article about black holes as computers. To a physicist, all physical systems are computers. Rocks, atom bombs, and galaxies may not run Linux or Linux, but they too register and process information. Every electron, photon, and other elementary particle stores bits of data, and every time two such particles interact, those bits are transformed. Physical existence and information content are inextricably linked, and there's a very good reason for that. Physical existence is information content, not physical, our experience of what we uh, perceive to be physical existence is simply information 
in this energetic fabric of our reality, which we are decoding into the reality we think is physical. And when in the Eastern religions they talk about Akashic records where um, everything that's ever happened is recorded, well, in a quantum computer, that is exactly what would happen. Every, everything would be um, recorded and stored as information. And I call this, this quantum computer interaction the cosmic internet. Just as a computer is um, reading information or decoding information that we call the internet and puts on the computer screen a decoded version of it, so we're doing exactly the same. And this world that we think is outside of us exists in a few centimeters of the brain, at the back of the brain in terms of the, the reality we visually see. And because animals are, and insects, plants, don't go to school, they don't read the newspapers, they don't watch the TV, they don't become desensitized from this by being pulled only into five sense reality like, like the human race overwhelmingly is. And when things are happening within this field, there is an information change. Uh, and this is why animals, insects, uh, etc., can respond to an earthquake coming or a storm coming, whereas humans only react to it when they see it. They react to it before because they're feeling this information change in the field because they're so um, sensitive to it. So, uh, we are living in an interactive wireless cosmos, and everything is information and information decoding information. The universe is information and information decoding information in the sense that if you put a disk into a computer, that's information going into a computer. The computer itself is information. That is information encoded to decode information. This is encoded information to be decoded. It's all information doing different things. So people say, what is the internet? Oh, they might say, well, it's graphics and it's moving pictures and it's, it's colors and it's words. Yes, it is. But the only place the internet exists in that form is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's codes, electrical uh, communication systems and so on. People say, um, what is television? Oh, well, it's moving pictures on a screen. Well, yes, it is, but only on the screen. Everywhere else, that information that, we, that the television decodes, in fact, our brain decodes, into the uh, pictures on the screen, it's, it doesn't look like that. You don't, see, you don't see pictures coming through the bloody window. It comes through in other forms of information and is decoded into that. That is what this world is, decoded information. So if you um, get a computer now, as, as long as you have Wi-Fi, and you can't get away from the bloody stuff these days, it seems, as long as you have Wi-Fi, you can connect anywhere in the world to a total collective global reality, which anyone in the world can also connect into as long as they've got Wi-Fi and a computer. And that is what we are. That is the, uh, the internet we know. This is the cosmic internet, because the internet is just basically a, a plagiarized version of the, the world that we, we live in. And the reason that they can connect the brain to computers and make the computers respond to thought is because they are connecting two computers, one technological, one biological. And so we're decoding the cosmic internet. And when you put the pieces together, I mean, they're there. Um, this is a, uh, a kind of a, a symbolic look at what Wi-Fi would look like if we could see it on the frequency that it operates on. Obviously, we can't, so it, it seems that Wi-Fi is invisible, but it's not. It's on a frequency we can't see. That is a mock-up of what it might look like. And we, in the same way, are decoding this reality from the cosmic information fields, the quantum fields of possibility and probability um, uh, that we uh, take from an energetic state into this world that we think we are experiencing. How we do that, I'll come to. So the base form of this universe, this reality, is waveform information. And waveform, as any scientist will tell you in that arena, can um, encode and hold and store vast, enormous amounts of information. And so the base um, 
nature of the universe, this reality, is waveform information. And we decode it through, uh, through the digital to what is the holographic, the illusory physical world that seems to be outside of us but isn't. And at this level of uh, energetic information, we can, uh, we can communicate with plants, we can communicate with animals, we can even communicate with rocks. Because all of those things are in their base form, waveform information. The slower it vibrates, the denser it appears in the holographic world of illusory physicality. The quicker it vibrates, the more ethereal it becomes until it's vibrating so quickly it's left our frequency and we can't see it. And at this level, you can communicate. You can hold rocks and you can get information out of them. You can uh, communicate with animals on this level because we're all connected here. Uh, Bill Hicks, the uh, very awake American comedian, said, all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream. And we are the imagination of ourselves. And the program is there to hijack our imagination of ourselves. You have no power. You are little me. The observer decodes reality. Uh, even mainstream science is beginning to look into this uh, area now because of the uh, information that's coming to light. Um, your entire life, this is a mainstream report, your entire life is an illusion. New test backs up theory that the world doesn't exist until we look at it, which sounds incredible, except it's true. Um, another mainstream report, your mind can control matter, says physicist. Um, and what they're saying is atomic particles were also shown to be waves. Whether they manifested as waves or as particles depended on whether someone was looking. Observation influenced the physical reality of the particles. In more technical language, observation collapsed the wave function. And what I suggest is happening here is observation is attention. When we give attention to waveform information, it triggers the decoding of that information into another form, which is why we have the, um, the collapse of the waveform into particle form, which is the reality that we're experiencing. The science calls that the observer effect. I would call it something else, the decoder effect. It's not that you look at it, it's that that focus, that attention, triggers this uh, decoding of waveform information into particle holographic information. Um, Nobel physicist John Wheeler said, no phenomenon is a real phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. I would say a decoded phenomenon, because that's what we're doing all the time, decoding our reality. Uh, this sums it up, really. Accidents happen. That's what everyone says. But in a quantum universe, there are no such things as accidents only possibilities and probabilities folded into existence by perception. Perception is everything. Not only what we do, what we think, what we won't do, what we'll challenge, what we won't challenge. It dictates the very reality that we experience and decode. Because our perception, all perceptions, are manifested as frequencies. And those perceptions interact with a quantum field of possibility and probability with frequencies that are of like kind. And that creates a feedback loop between perception and manifestation out of the possibility and probability quantum field of, uh, of uh, manifestations that operate in that same frequency band. Thus, perception becomes experience reality, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You think the, 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 the glass is half full, you will interact with the quantum uh, uh, quantum field of possibility and probability, and your life will express experience of the glass half full. Um, anyone thinks that it's not an illusion? I've seen this happen a number of times. If you, if, how can you walk through fire and not get burned? It's ridiculous. Impossible. No, it's not. If you walk through fire and your perception is 
that you will get burned, someone's going to be calling an ambulance very quickly. If you go, and I've seen this done, like I say, a number of times, if you go into another level of perception, another state of consciousness, you can walk through fire and not get burned because you are not manifesting the same reality as belief that you will get burned. And in, an illusion can only burn an illusion if we believe it can and create that feedback loop that manifests the experience from the perception. So if we go deeper into this, the control of the program of our perception is dictating through this feedback loop our very experienced reality all the time which is why we need to take our minds back, our perceptions back. This is the revolution, not stockpiling weapons. When we expand our awareness, we interact with this quantum field of possibility and probability in a much more expanded way, on much higher frequencies. And therefore, we create a feedback loop that, that creates a very different experience. Suddenly, life becomes an adventure. It becomes incredibly synchronistic. You can achieve things that you never could believe you could before. You can't be stopped because of the way you're interacting with reality, whereas if you interact in another way, then you can be stopped with what you're doing. Everything is perception, and that's why they want to hold us there, because while we're there, we will manifest a feedback loop that relates to that perception. This is, this, this is the bottom line. This is deep in the rabbit hole in terms of the way that humanity is controlled. All you s that you see in front of you is how you feel inside your head. Exactly, because of this feedback loop. Now, form is information. It's not physical, it's information. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you look at a television and it seems to be seamless pictures, but it's not. It's um, pixels. If you divide a still image into a collection of small colored dots, your brain will reassemble the dots into a meaningful image. We only see television as we see it because of the, the way the brain decodes reality and puts the dots together literally into a moving picture. And this focus of attention, which collapses the waveform into particle form, into holographic form, um, that's everything including our own bodies. The base form of the body is waveform information. It too becomes what appears to be physical, holographic, when it's observed. Um, form is deco a decoded projection of energetic information fields. A decoded, we decode the information into what appears to be physical, but is holographic in ways I'll come to. So the base form of the body is waveform information it becomes apparently physical only when we observe our own bodies. Um, and therefore, if you can play with the decoding system of the brain and the genetic system in general, then you can play massively with people's sense of reality. Um, and hypnotists can do this, good ones. Um, a few years ago, I, I, I read a book. It came out in the, 19, in 19, the 1990s. It was called The Holographic Universe by a guy called Michael Tolbert. And what he did was look at all the information with mainstream scientists, yes, but, but who were at this cutting edge of looking at the fact that this world in is, is an illusion, and it's actually a holographic illusion. And in that book, he told a story of when his father had a party at home, and he got a stage hypnotist along to do party tricks. And uh, at one point, he describes how uh, this man called Tom was sitting in a chair, and he was put into this hypnotic state. And the hypnotist said to him, when I bring you back to a waking state, you're not going to be able to see your daughter in the room. At which point, he led the daughter to stand in front of her father, so he's looking into her belly. So he brings him back, apparently, to a waking state. And he said, Tom, can you see your daughter in the room? He looks around, he can't see her. Uh, people are laughing in the room, they can see her. He can't see her. The hypnotist then went behind the, the daughter and put his hand in the small of her back and said, I'm holding something, Tom, what am I holding? And he looked bewildered because it was obvious to him. He says, oh, you're holding a watch. He said, can you read the inscription on the watch? He peered forward, he read the inscription on the watch. His daughter standing between him and the watch. 
Now, if I said that to a mainstream scientist, they'd say it was impossible, ridiculous, made-up story. No, it's not. It's perfectly explainable. Um, the base form of this reality and the human form, including the daughter, is waveform information. Um, and unless Tom decodes the waveform information into a holographic uh, state in his, in his head, in his brain, in the, decode, in the physical, visible um, areas of the brain, then she does not exist in his reality. And if she doesn't exist in his reality, he can see behind her, because in his reality, she's not there. But, and, and what has happened is the, uh, the, 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 the uh, hypnotist has put very, very uh, uh, similar theme. He's put a firewall in Tom's brain through that hypnotic suggestion, so his brain will not decode the daughter's energy field. Thus, she doesn't appear in his reality. And when you do decode it, suddenly... There they are, in your reality. Now imagine if, if we are collectively manipulated in terms of our perceptions, what there is to see that we never see, that we never bring into manifestation, which we other otherwise would. Looking for answers in the physical is like looking for the movie in the screen. If you, if you, if you try to change a movie on the screen. You'll never do it. That's why this, this, this web of manipulation is quite happy for people running around thinking they can change this world in this world. Once this world is as we perceive it, it's like the movie hitting the screen. There's no changing it. You have to change what is manifesting it. Then you can change the world and you can change it quickly. Don't need anyone taking the minutes and starting an organization. You, you can change it. Why? You can change perception, thus you change the feedback loop, thus the manifestation of that feedback loop in the world of holographic illusion becomes different to the world that was before. This is the way out of here. If only we would realize it. So when people say everything is within you, it is. Everything is within us, not without. And Anita Morjani said... In, um, the near-death experiencer. I believe that the greatest truths of the universe don't uh, lie outside in the study of the stars and the planets. They lie deep within us in the magnificence of our heart, mind, and soul. Until we understand what is within, we can't understand what is without. Well, what is without is what is within. We can't understand that unless we understand this, because that's just a projection of this. So the body, if you break it down, is a biological computer system. And again, in its base form, it is waveform. Only looks as it does when it's decoded. So um, you take a computer, and when it ceases to process information, we say, Our compu my computer's dead. I'm going to get another one. Reincarnation, there you go. <laughs> um, and a computer goes to sleep so that it um, uh, doesn't have to process uh, information um, in a, a full-out way all the time. It rests and uses less energy. That's what the body does when we go to sleep. Uh, the, uh, the computer has an antivirus system to um, protect the computer from, from attacks like viruses. We have a stupendous one, if only we would leave it alone, called the human immune system. The brain of a computer is called the CPU, the central processing unit, which processes uh, the central processing point of information in a computer. We have the brain, which basically does the same. Um, a computer has a hard drive. We have the genetic structure and DNA. And if you, um, if you look at the acupuncture meridians, this is uh, from a picture um, taken with a... Uh, a tracer die at the Necker Hospital in Paris, um, it looks like, um, it looked to me when I first saw this, it's like a motherboard in a computer. And the, these meridian lines are carrying information around the body, and that information is interacting with the um, cosmic internet. And while this information is passing around the body at its optimum speed and its optimum way, we are healthy because there is information balance. Once this information starts passing around the body too slowly or too fast, there is an imbalance of information 
and communication, and thus we have something we call dis-ease, disharmony. What's the first thing that happens when, when we think something's wrong with our computer? We say, my computer's so slow today. Yes, because the information's not passing around it as it should at optimum levels. That's what happens to the human body. And that's why in um, ancient uh, Chinese acupuncture, People paid the acupuncturist when they were well and didn't pay them when they were ill because his job was to keep that process of information in balance. And, you know, people look, because again, the postage stamp consensus, they look at uh, acupuncture and they say it's crazy that you can put a needle in the foot to cure a headache. But what are the needles doing and these other acupuncture techniques? They're balancing the flow of energy. That's what they're doing. And if, uh, as is the case, these meridian lines are circuits, then if there's a problem on a circuit in the toe, which actually is affecting and causing a problem in the, in the, in the head with a headache, it's no good putting a needle in the head because it won't change anything. Ignorance. Ignorance is something that waves its hand in arrogance. The arrogance of ignorance, I call it, when it's just uninformed. We have a, 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 an earth that... Um, has meridian lines of energy, we call ley lines, etc. So if you look at the five senses, and again, if you see them in their base state, their, their waveform, they are decoding waveform information into electrical information. They are communicating it to the brain, and the brain is decoding that electrical information into digital and holographic information, which is the world we think we are experiencing. It's, it's an obvious one is the ear, which is taking uh, vibrational information, turning it into electrical information, and communicating it to the brain, which then we hear as sound. And so, there are different parts of the brain that specialize in the decoding of different senses. And there is where the world that we see actually exists. Extraordinary. Uh, Amazing illusion. That's where the world that we're currently experiencing visually exists. And so this scene in the Matrix is absolutely spot on. This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. And that's all they are. And what if you could, de you could program the brain by programming perception to decode those electrical signals in a way that suits your agenda of control? The brain is pitch black dark but can see light. How possible? Because that, that light I'm looking at only exists in that form here. I'm looking at waveform information, which I'm decoding into that in my head so I don't need to see outside of it. The brain does not have to be light for me to see light because it's a decoding mechanism. This is Alan Watts again. Without the brain, the world is devoid of light, heat, weight, solidity, motion, space, time, or any other imaginable feature. All these phenomena are interactions or transactions of vibrations um, uh, with a certain arrangement of neurons. It's such an illusion that, here's a question, does a falling tree make a noise? Only if you hear it. Uh, because when a falling tree falls, it doesn't make a noise. It makes a disturbance in the air, in the atmosphere, in the energetic field. And that disturbance is then picked up by the ears as a waveform information field. It then communicates that to the brain in electrical form, and the brain then hears the tree falling. No one there. A tree makes no noise when it falls. And here's a, um, an explanation by a scientist called Robert Lanza in a book called Biocentrism. And he's just describing the simplest thing, how we manifest the sight and experience of a candle. The flame is emitting photons or packets of electrical, electromagnetic energy, tiny packets, each pulsing electrically and magnetically. These invisible electromagnetic waves strike a human retina and if and only if 
the waves happen to measure between 400 and 700 nanometers in length from crest to crest, then their energy is just right to deliver a stimulus to the 8 million cone-shaped cells in the retina. Each, in turn, send an electrical pulse to a neighbor neuron, and on up the line it goes at 250 miles an hour until it reaches the optical uh, lobe of the brain in the back of the head, what I talked about a few minutes ago. There, a cascading complex of neurons fire from the incoming stimuli, and we subjectively perceive this experience as a yellow brightness occurring in a place we have been conditioned to call the external world. An external world that doesn't actually exist outside of us. It's inside of us as the world of the computer, decoded world, exists inside the computer. Who creates the universe that we see? We do. What kind of universe, what kind of society we create is dictated by our perceptions of everything. All that we see or seem is just a dream within a dream. The dream is the dreamer. The dreamer is the dream. Because one is a decoded expression of the other. And therefore, if you want to control the dream, control human reality, control the perceptions of the dreamer. And then you set up the feedback loop to create the reality you want via your target population. Our reality, this reality we're experiencing, is a, a, a reality of frequency and vibration, information in that form. Nikola Tesla said, if you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. Concerning matter, Einstein said, we have been all wrong. What we have called matter is really energy, whose vibration has been lowered to be perceptible to the senses. There is no matter. There is only light and sound and decoded information. Now, there's a whole area you might have come across called cymatics. And what they do is they get like a, a metal plate, and they'll put particles all over it, various substances, um, and that's the random world. They, they just put particles on, and that's wherever they are. That is symbolic of all that is, has been, and ever can be potential waiting to manifest. How that we manifest that is depicted and decided by our perceptions and therefore the frequency interaction we have with those particles. And you can see this in cymatics because what they then do after you've got these random particles all over the plate is they play across the particles a frequency. And you see the particles form into geometrical shapes based on that frequency. The frequency changes, other geometrical shapes suddenly appear to reflect the information in the change frequency. And uh, here's an example. That's all potential waiting to manifest. And so you play a certain frequency, and the frequency starts to manifest form out of that potential. And interestingly, the higher the frequency, the more complex the patterns, the geometrical patterns. Because the higher the frequency, the more information you can process, and therefore, um, experience. And as the frequency gets higher, the pattern gets more complex. And that's, uh, that's cymatics. One more. That is so symbolic of what happens. And that's why music either inspires us and syncs with us, or we say, shut that bloody row off, it's driving me mad. It's whether the frequency syncs with you or whether it doesn't, because that's what, of course, music is. It is a frequency. This is why um, ancient peoples and, and uh, uh, the more open religions 
um, work so much with sound and chants and stuff because they're, impo they're impacting a frequency upon the energetic field around them. Um, same with um, the didgeridoo in, um, in Australia. Uh, Gareth has got an album out called Three, which is um, recorded in three, uh, 432 hertz instead of the normal 440 because of the way the frequency syncs with people better. Science discovers a song that reduces anxiety by 65%. It, it's not the song, it's the frequency. The frequency impacts itself upon the body and, and, and therefore um, has the effect of reducing anxiety because anxiety is distorted energetic states, uh, what we call stress, and, and, and that frequency of the music can uh, rebalance that harmony and thus the anxiety disappears. Information, the information we're decoding is encoded in the frequency band of what we call light. The electromagnetic spectrum. It, um, uh, Isaac Newton um, coined the, 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 the term spectrum for the rainbow, and that's very appropriate because spectrum is Latin for apparition or phantom, which is basically what the rainbow is. We are decoding uh, information and frequency, and the rainbow only exists in our head. Colors are frequencies. Different colors, different frequencies, different subfrequencies. And uh, black um, absorbs um, all uh, colors. Uh, different colors reflect some and absorb others, and white reflects all colors. And so when you are looking at something like that, as with the candle, the colors of the flowers only exist in your decoded experience when you decode the frequencies of the colors into the colors that we experience. Uh, this is why uh, this was uh, from that earlier um, text. The existence of the rainbow depends on the conical photoreceptors in your eyes. To animals without cones, the rainbow does not exist. So you don't just look at a rainbow, you create it. Uh, my brain said Nikola Tesla is only a receiver, uh, a receiver of information. Um, and a processor of information it, in a way. But what information? It can take the information and the perceptions of phantom self and it will manifest an experience of phantom self. Or it can take the information of infinite self and it can manifest an experience of infinite self. The brain's just there to, to, to do what you um, allow it to do, what information you allow it to uh, decode. So you can decode a reality where everything's lovely like that, or you can decode a reality like that. And it's our choice which one we do. Belief is perception. Perception is frequency. And so if you can control someone's belief, you control their perception, you control their perception, you control their frequency. This is why uh, the, the conspiracy doesn't care what you believe as long as you believe it in a five sense way and as long as you believe it rigidly to the excuse, exclusion of everything else because then they got you. They've got you in the frequency prison no matter what that belief is. The auric field is constantly changing colors because it's constantly changing frequencies based on changing emotion and mental states. And uh, as I said a minute ago, that as the frequency increases, as you allow your frequency to increase by expanding your perception of self into the greater consciousness instead of little me, as the frequency increases, the amount of energy carried by the wave also increases in proportion to the frequency. We saw that with, um, with cymatics, and therefore the more you expand your awareness, the more information you can process, the more incredible your experience becomes. So, to keep us in servitude, we have to be held in a state of belief. You believe in the Muslim religion, you believe in the Jewish religion, you believe in the Christian religion, the Hindu religion, they're not bothered. As long as you believe in it rigidly to the exclusion of all else, you're all in the same frequency band. Um, everything is energy, said Einstein, and that's all there is to it. Match the frequency of the reality you want, and you can't help but get that reality, and that's how we're being manipulated all the time. You go and open your... Awareness to the greater awareness, you operate on a different frequency, you see the world in a completely different way and have a completely different experience. Now, the pineal gland um, in uh, the brain is part of this decoding system. Part, some people call it the mind's eye, part of the third eye system. It's like a, an, an antenna.
that uh, decodes information beyond the five senses. And if people think that little rice-like pineal gland couldn't, uh, couldn't do that, well, you look at a, a, a little antenna you stick in your computer and you can pick up radio stations, television stations from all over the world from that little antenna. And the same rods and cones found in the eyes are found in the pineal gland, which kind of leads us to why they call it the third eye, which sees beyond the five senses. And you can see um, the symbolism of this pineal gland all over the ancient world in various uh, ways, because they understood, um, the, the, the more awake of them, what it did and how it in interacted with reality. Now, talking about how they want to hold us in five sense reality, um, fluoride in drinking water, which is uh, just a poison, a toxin, one of, its, um, one of its consequences is it calcifies the pineal gland. Now, the people putting it in the water will not be doing it for that reason. They'll be doing what they're told. They'll believe that it's good for teeth and all that shite. But actually, the people in the shadows who are ultimately making sure that, water go, that uh, fluoride goes into drinking water know that it is affecting the way that we can perceive reality beyond the five senses. Children's clothing found loaded with endocrine-disrupting chemicals. The pineal gland is part of the endocrine system of glands. Not by accident that that is going on. Now, the pineal gland is also crystalline. It would be because it's a, a, a receiver transmitter of information. And uh, the whole body is crystalline. The um, membrane of every cell, and we have trillions of them, is a liquid crystal. We uh, are in a, a crystalline form... Uh, because the body, DNA2, is a receiver transmitter of information. There's been a lot of brilliant research on DNA as a transmitter receiver uh, done by Russian scientists, among others. And, of course, that um, would be the case because the body is constantly interacting with um, the cosmic Internet. Crystalline DNA, uh, for that same reason. And DNA is a receiver transmitter. This is a... Uh, a description of that. From the characteristic form of this giant molecule, a wound double helix, the DNA represents an ideal electromagnetic antenna. On one hand, it is elongated and thus a blade which can take up very well electrical pulses. On the other hand, seen from above, it has the form of a ring and thus is a very magnetical antenna. And um, DNA is made up of four codes, A, C, G, and T, and depending uh, where they are in relationship to each other, dictates if it manifests as a virus or a human body. Um, and um, these um, codes also relate to something else, which I'll come to as we go along. DNA, again, um, in its base form, is energetic waveform information. We only see the holographic decoded version of it. San Francisco Chronicle. DNA is a universal software code. From bacteria to humans, the basic instructions for life are written with the same language. And there's a reason for that, which I'm coming to. So what we call human is a software program. It's not what we are. We are the um, consciousness, the awareness experiencing that program. But human is not what we are. It's what we're experiencing. We are consciousness having the experience. Now, when we um, start looking at the world, reality, from the, these uh, points that I've been talking about, so many mysteries disappear. Mysteries that mainstream science either dismisses or can't um, answer. Um, and it's worth remembering, this is a guy called um, Richard Dawkins, Professor Richard Dawkins, who is um, a, an Oxford professor who is vehemently anti anything alternative and any other explanation for life other than basically this is the world that we see and it's not malleable and all that stuff. Um, and we shouldn't forget when we hold up academics and scientists as unquestionable uh, fountains of knowledge that they have been through the same perception programs as everyone else, except they've been in them for longer and continue to remain in them now in the education institutions of the world. They are some of the most programmed of all with the postage stamp consensus. And they have this arrogance of ignorance, many of them, not all of them, in which they dismiss anything outside of that consensus. And so their perceptions, the perceptions of the people we hold up as those that 
are, that know all these things, they are in the same perceptual prison as everyone else, often more so. And as I, I say in the latest book, you don't need a scientific mind to understand reality. You need a free one. Often it's the scientific mind that, that keeps you from understanding reality because it holds on to the program. Nikola Tesla, brilliant quote, the scientists of today think deeply instead of clearly. One must be sane to think clearly, but one can think deeply and be quite insane. The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. And one of the reasons we don't move on faster in our understanding of reality is that so many people whose job it is is to, is to uncover that reality are some of the most programmed on the planet. Nikola Tesla said, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, uh, it will be, make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of our existence because he realized that this is just a projection of non-physical phenomenon. So when you break into, um, into looking at reality from these perspectives, like I say, mysteries start to disappear. One of them is, what do you mean the world isn't solid? Got to be. How can it not be solid? What do you mean the world isn't solid? And I, 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 I kind of completely understand. We are interacting with it all the time as if it's solid, physical, real. But that resistance is not... Uh, people say, well, you know, if it's not solid, why can't I walk through a wall? Well, you could if you want a really different frequency to the wall. This is why ghosts walk, uh, go through walls. They're on a different frequency. Um, but... Um, that solid-to-solid -solid resistance that we experience is actually an electromagnetic resistance in the waveform level of reality. Two waveform fields resisting each other. We experience it in the decoded world of the holographic reality as a solid resistance, but it's actually an electromagnetic resistance. Now, what is happening is more and more mainstream scientists are starting to look at this because it's the only thing that makes any sense of the realities that uh, they can't explain. Here's a mainstream report, 99 point all those nines percent of your body is empty space. I actually say it's all empty space, all of it. Well, not empty space, there's no such thing as empty, but it, not, none of it is actually physical, not even that tiny uh, part of 1%. Um, and what we're told, you see, is that atoms make up the physical world. Accepted, physical world made of atoms. Well, atoms have no solidity. So how can something that's not solid make up a solid world? And here with the nucleus and the electrons, the distance between the nucleus and the electrons is only what it appears there so I can get it on the screen. The distance, comparatively, is phenomenal. There's no solidity to an atom. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a great quote. If the nucleus of the atom were the size of a peanut, the atom would be about the size of a baseball stadium. If we lost all the dead space inside our atoms, we would each be able to fit into a particle of dust, and the entire human race would fit into the volume of a sugar cube. It makes that racism stuff look a bit freaking nonsensical, doesn't it? Really, when you think about it as I've been trying to get across why they're calling me a racist. <laughs> Isn't it funny? It's hilarious. I have to laugh. Inversion. Did I mention that? Uh, so what is happening is when you take a, a disk and of information, as the computer is decoding that information in, into what you see on the screen, it goes through certain different transformational states. And what we call atoms is part of the transformational states of... Um, the waveform information being decoded into holographic information. Atoms do not have to be solid to make up a solid world because there is no solid world. So waveform becomes digital holographic, holographic digital. Um, that, that's the world that we are experiencing. So the world is a hologram, but not outside of us, inside of us, as I'll come to. For, uh, I, most people will know this anyway, but for any that don't, um, to create the holograms that we see in the shops, 
They take a laser, what's called coherent light, um, and uh, they um, deflect part of it directly onto a photographic film, and another part of it basically photographs the object in waveform uh, and then is deflected back onto the film where it collides with the other part of the laser that's gone direct. And that creates what they call an, a, uh, a waveform interference pattern. Waveform interference pattern. And then, when you fire a laser at the interference pattern, suddenly a three-dimensional holographic expression of what's being what's been photographed manifests out of the waveform information pattern. And what that's doing is mirroring the way we create this reality out of waveform information. And, and, and the best of them look as solid as you and me. Waveform pattern, information, looks like a fingerprint, that's probably not an accident, and waveform pattern, uh, laser, and some of them look as solid as you and me. This lady here is in another city. She's standing on a stage with this guy as a holographic projection. All these people, apart from him, are holograms. Um, all these people are holograms, including her, that looks so real in relation to him. This is the world that we are living in, taking the waveform, creating the holographic decoded expression of it that we call the world. These are two mainstream science magazines, New Scientists, uh, Britain, obviously Scientific American, America, uh, all now uh, with articles looking at this. You are a hologram projected from the edge of the universe. Um, are you a hologram? Quantum physics says the entire universe might be. They're having to go down this road because it's the only thing that explains the world we're living in. This is a more recent one with Japanese researchers um, who presented evidence to suggest that the universe is in fact nothing but a projection. I've been writing that for goodness knows how many years. Because if, if, you, if you don't, if, you, if you're not imprisoned by perceptual download, I left school at 15, and you let your mind go free, you can see the freaking obvious, anyone can. But do we live in a hologram? No, we don't. We live in an information field, and we create the hologram by decoding that information. So the holographic world is not outside of us, it's inside of us. Um, and one of the great characteristics of a hologram is every part of the hologram is a smaller version of the whole. Therefore, if you um, cut a holographic print into four, and you fire the laser at the four pieces, you don't get a quarter part of the whole picture, you get a quarter uh, uh, version size of the whole picture. Because every part of a hologram is a smaller version of the whole. Yes, as you go down um, and, and you cut the picture up, it gets less clarity, but it's still a, ver a version of the whole picture in miniature. Um, as above, so below, that's where this comes from because it's holographic. Every part of a hologram is a smaller version of the whole, so we are a smaller per part of the universe. Whatever happened to little Ethel on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the checkout? I have no power. And so this is why people like reflexologists and acupuncturists can find uh, parts of the hand, the ear, every part of the body which represents the body as a whole. And they treat part of the body, by, but, but actually to treat the whole. Because in every part of the body is the information of the whole body, because the body's a hologram. That's how it works. And same with palm reading, people that can really do it, because the hand, as part of a hologram, contains the information of the body, and therefore the body as a whole can be read from the hand. And this is why you look at brain cell activity, you look at the universe, and they look so similar. Um, this is a mainstream report, Stardust Melody, humans are undeniably made up of cosmic dust, new study finds. But that must be so. If the, if the, the universe um, is a, a hologram, then 
everything must be an expression of that hologram in miniature. And again, more mysteries that come to be explained from this. And notice, because the normal that I call postage stamp normal is so narrow and limited, when there is phenomena happening that can't be explained by the normal postage stamp, it has to be given another name, the paranormal. Well, it's just as normal, in fact, more bloody normal than the postage stamp normal. So, ghosts, what we call ghosts and entities, passing through walls because they're on different frequencies. So there's not that electromagnetic resistance. Um, uh, you turn on a radio, and you're not quite on the dial. You can get a main station, which is the dominant one, but you also get interference from another one. Um, it's, not as, uh, it's not as powerful, but you've got interference. You can hear it. Visually, that's what a ghost is. It's not absolutely in our frequency band, but it's, it's enough in it that it can be perceived as ethereal. If we were on the same uh, frequency band as the, the ghost, the entity, it would look as solid as you and me. And so when um, people say, there's a freaking ghost over there. And someone's going, don't be so bloody stupid. I can't see anything. No, they can't. Because this person is slightly more, at least slightly more sensitive, can get a bit further into the visual field than her friend. Therefore, she sees something that she can't see because she can see slightly beyond the frequency. She can only see the frequency. Um, psychics, mediums, what they're doing is expanding their awareness, connecting with other levels of reality, and bringing that into this uh, reality as information. The ones that get just a little bit out there, they're saying, I've, I've got, I'm getting a Mary. I'm getting a Mary. Is there a Mary? Anyone know a Mary? But the ones that get right out there, they can bring phenomenal information from higher frequencies of awareness into this reality. Uh, water has a memory. This, is, um, this explains uh, the whole thing about homeopathy. Water has a memory because it's conscious. Everything's conscious, including water. Now, um, this is a wonderful example of postage stamp, um, postage stamp mentality. This is Professor Dame Sally Davis. She's the, the UK government chief medical officer who um, shared her wisdom and expanded awareness with us by saying homeopaths are peddlers and homeopathy is rubbish. What that means is we can't explain how it works, so it, got, it can't possibly bloody work. Okay, and now this is a mainstream article in uh, the Daily Mail, the Australian edition. Um, homeopathy for your pet, that's barking, warn vets. More than 2,500 use letter to demand alternative medicine is blacklisted. And here's the key line in the article. But scientists argue the cures of homeopathy are so diluted they are unlikely to contain any of the original substance. Can I touch it, taste it, and all the rest? Okay, it exists. I can't, it doesn't. So this dismissal of homeopathy is such a wonderful example of postage stamp consensus uh, that keeps us in servitude, including the institutions in servitude, to ignorance. Now, what they're saying then is homeopathy is quackery because it dilutes the substance so much that in the end there's no substance left, only the water. Okay. Uh, this is Masaru Emoto, a friend of mine. Fortunately, he, he died in 2014. And um, he, is a, he was a Japanese researcher who became uh, famous for, um, for looking at the impact on water crystals of different things like words, emotions, mobile phones, polluted water, pollution. And what he used to do, I, I went in, to Tokyo to, his, um, to where he did this once. He would get a canister of water and he would um, put words on the side, like love and thanks, or I hate you, I want to kill you. He would then freeze the water very fast with this technology he had, and then he would photograph the crystals. The crystals in the water 
in terms of what was on the canister, the difference was extraordinary, as you can see now. That is a water crystal on the left that had love and thanks written on the side. That is a crystal that had I hate you, I want to kill you written on the side. Because of the vibrational frequency impact of those two states of intention on the water. In other words, on the frequency waveform level of the water. Now, obviously, when we speak, what is happening? We're creating a vibrational frequency energetic field with the vocal cords. And just like the tree that makes no noise unless we hear it, um, this frequency field will not be heard unless it's decoded. At the moment, I'm decoding it for myself. People are decoding my field here. But only when we decode it does this frequency field become the words that we, um, we hear. Now, the same is true of the written word. Because the written word is a holographic expression, a decoded expression, of an information state based on the intent and the nature of the words. So when you write, I hate you, I want to uh, kill you on the side, on a waveform level, that phrase is a distorted waveform informational state, frequency state. And it will then impact that upon the frequency uh, of the water. So when you photograph it in the crystal form, you see the hate. When you, when you, when you, when you um, write love and thanks on the side, that intent manifests a harmonious, infinite love is the only truth, everything else is illusion state. And therefore, that harmonious state of frequency is impacted upon the water. And when you photograph the crystals, you see those beautiful geometrical harmonic uh, patterns. That's how we are affecting this world all the time. Every time we feel emotion, every time we speak, every time we uh, interact with our perceptual state. So, if they can get us constantly anxious, constantly in fear, constantly angry, constantly uh, in a state of hatred, then we are manifesting that distortion into the energetic field, which that like, like fish swimming in the sea. You want to affect all the fish, affect the sea, and therefore we are being affected ourselves by the distortions in this, in this field, which we as a human race are ourselves creating. And those that are behind all this know exactly what they're doing, as I'll come to in part three. So, love and appreciation. You make me sick, I want to kill you. That was just thank you. That was polluted river water photographed in crystal state. That was polluted water in a crystal state before what is called prayer. What is prayer? Concentrated thought. Concentrated focus interaction with the field of um, possibility and probability. The quantum field. And what they did is they took that water in that state and they uh, projected uh, love, harmony at that water, and then they took another photograph of the same water. And that's how we can clean up the world, by cleaning up ourselves and cleaning up our perceptions. Now, um, the Stuttgart Institute in Germany found a way of photographing um, information in water. That's not how they did it. That's obviously symbolic. If you go onto uh, YouTube, I think it's still there, and you put water has memory, you'll see a five-minute video about this. Um, what they did was um, got a big tank of water, and they put a flower in it, and then they took the flower out. That's all they did. And then they photographed the water through this process they have, and they found the information of the flower was in every droplet of water, every single one that they, that they, they tested, and that's because it's holographic. Every part of the is, is a whole. Now, what I'm saying is, by putting the, the, the flower in the water and taking it out, it transferred this information to the water that quickly. What they then did was get another tank of water, and they got people up from the local community, 
And they, they had a dish with their name on, and they asked them to just take four droplets of water out of the tank and put it in the dish with their name on. What they found was each set of four droplets from each person was different to the other people, but each four from the same person was basically the same. In other words, that process of doing that had transferred that person's unique energetic signature onto the water that went into the dish. That's how we're interacting with the cosmic internet all the time, and our perceptual state is affecting it, and its perceptual state is affecting us because we are all connected to that field. So, Dame Sally Davis, um, homeopathy works in the right hands because although there's no substance left in the water, the information of the substance, like the information of the flower, remains in the water, and it's the information, the waveform information of the substance that does the healing at the waveform level of the body. But because mainstream science doesn't see that, it don't think homeopathy can possibly work, only because it's ignorant of reality. And you look at um, uh, viruses in computers, what are they? Rogue information. You look at a polluted river, it's rogue information. If you could see it on a waveform level, it would just be distorted waveform information, distorting everything else. Pharmaceutical drugs, if you could see them on a waveform level, you'd see distorted waveform information, which we are introducing to the waveform field of the body. That's why they're so devastating. I love it. They say, uh, it's got side effects. There's no such thing as side effects, mate. There's just effects. That's all there are. Effects. So it's all happening on this waveform level. And that's we have, we, are, we have death by doctor worldwide on such a vast frickin' scale, a stunning scale. Because if you asked me to fix your engine, it would never work again. I know nothing about engines. So someone who knows nothing about the body and its nature, please just leave my body alone. I'll find someone who knows. And so what, what we have is complementary and alternative medicine, which, which often, I mean, I'm not saying, oh, that's good either, but um, that which is, that is, is, is outstanding. Um, and what they say is mainstream medicine only treats the symptom, not the cause. But it can't do anything other because it's treating the hologram. It's treating the projection. Therefore, it can only treat the symptom because the symptom in the hologram is a flaw and distortion in the waveform field. What the best of alternative medicine does, it goes direct to the waveform field, just like acupuncture does. And so it can only treat the cause, uh, uh, treat the symptom rather than not the cause. Scientists have discovered a way to destroy cancer tumors using nothing but sound waves. Oh, really? Uh, you'll be telling me the sun affects the temperature next. <laughs> what? Of course it does, because sound is frequency, which changes other frequencies like the frequency of cancer. Cosmic communication. Um, this uh, comes into the electrical nature of the universe, and this is where Tesla gets his, um, all the power in the world is all around us. This is uh, an area of research known as the electric universe. Um, uh, Wallace Thornhill is an Australian physicist. David Tolbert is an American researcher. They are two of the leading lights of it. And it is a, a fantastic area of scientific research now, which is rewriting the nature of the, um, uh, the, the universe and how it works. Uh, the electric universe, it's called. Also, um, the Thunderbolts project is another name. Now, we know that there is electricity around us because we see lightning, which is a, a discharge of, of um, electrical energy when it builds up to the point where it has to discharge. But people don't realize that when you, when you have in the low level of our atmosphere, an electric, uh, a lightning strike, it goes up into the cosmos under different names like uh, tendrils, sprites, and elves, because what we're looking at is a vast electrical, electromagnetic field of information communication, um, which is going to lead us somewhere before we end this section um, in terms of the reality we're experiencing. So in mainstream report, high-speed solar winds increase lightning strikes on Earth, yes, because there is a constant exchange of information through this electrical, electromagnetic system. 
we have electric tornadoes. Uh, they're they're fast-rotating electromagnetic fields. That's why they appear in electrical storms around the time of electrical storms. Of course, the Northern Lights are an electrical light show, uh, electrical comets. Um, and Tesla said this. As I said earlier, all peoples everywhere should have free energy sources. Electric power is everywhere present in unlimited quantities and can drive the world's machinery without the need for coal, oil, and gas. This electrical universe is what he was talking about. And it's all around us, and we could have all the power we needed if only they would uh, use that potential. So we're told that gravity um, holds everything together, but the electrical force is about a thousand trillion, trillion, trillion times more powerful than gravity. Uh, this is the magnetic force, incredibly, incredibly powerful. And what the electric universe researchers say is actually the planetary bodies are held in a form of stability, not through gravity, but through electromagnetic uh, fields. And when those fields are affected, then the planets go walkabout. And I write about that in my books in, in great detail in terms of what happened in the relatively recent, what we call, past. Now, the observable universe is 99.999% plasma, called the fourth state of matter. And plasma just happens to be the almost perfect medium for electricity and electromagnetism to pass through. Um, the phenomena in the heavens can be re, um, uh, or, or reproduced um, in plasma-focused devices in laboratories because we're looking at electrical, electromagnetic plasma phenomenon in the heavens. Um, one of the things they found, it was found by a guy called uh, Irvin Langmuir, um, an American-Swedish uh, scientist. He found that where an electrical charge of a certain type meets another electrical charge in the plasma of a certain type, automatically a barrier is thrown up between them. And that is what defines the magnetospheres of planets uh, and uh, what we call planetary energy fields. Um, the sun is almost entirely plasma because it is not a generator of energy, it is a processor of energy, according to the electrical universe um, proposition, which I absolutely agree with, the electrical sun. Um, what we're told on the postage stamp consensus is the sun is a nuclear reactor and the power comes from inside. As the electrical universe researchers point out, virtually every observation of the sun says that that's not true. Um, and in fact, if you look at the sun uh, from an ultraviolet level, around the equator, there is what they call a torus, like a donut, um, and that accumulates electrical power. And it accumulates it and accumulates it and accumulates it until, just like lightning in our atmosphere, it has to discharge. And they say that then, when this discharges happen, at, at, at very powerful um, points in electrical cycles of the, uh, uh, affecting the solar system, then that lightning or charge smacks into the sun and causes what we call sunspots. Uh, mainstream science says the sunspots are, are punched from inside. The electrical universe says actually punched from outside, and people are starting to see that now. And so, therefore, the more electrical power that builds up in that torus, the more it discharges, the more sunspots there are, and sunspots are the measurement that science has for the um, activity of the sun. Interestingly, on the surface of the sun, it's around 5,000 degrees Kelvin, according to mainstream science, and they say the upper levels are about 200 million uh, degrees Kelvin, which would indicate where the power is coming from, and some of these uh, sunspots are as, as big as the Earth. And like I say, mainstream science is being pulled this way because it's the only thing that their findings are explainable by. Professor of Physics at New Jersey Institute of Technology said um, recently, a sunspot activity, our new observations suggest that disturbances created in the solar outer atmosphere can also cause direct and significant uh, perturbations on the surface 
through magnetic fields, a phenomenon not envisaged by any contemporary solar eruption models. This is what the uh, electric universe people have been pointing out. So as the cycle of electrical power moves through this part of uh, the universe, um, the sun is at sometimes processing big amounts of power, sometimes not, and that is the cycle of sun activity, because the sun is processing the information and turning it into what we call light, whereas it's not coming from the center, as we've always been told. David uh, Sibek, project scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, the satellites have found evidence of magnetic ropes connecting the Earth's upper atmosphere directly to the sun. We believe that solar winds flow in along these ropes, providing energy for electromagnetic uh, storms and auroras. That's what the electric universe has been saying. Everything's connected by uh, an electrical circuit, and that is how the sun affects Earth temperature. So, what I'm saying after all this is the heavens are an information matrix. We look at the heavens in holographic form, and they look like that. But if you could see them on another level, it would be an electrical electromagnetic uh, communication system, uh, what I call the cosmic um, internet. And if you think about it, um, the internet and computers, they work with electrical information, information communicated electrically. The brain processes information electrically. Those two electric things can interact with the cosmic internet. We can see now how uh, powerful electricity is in carrying information where they can put the internet around someone's house through the electrical systems. Um, this is uh, another finding uh, last year. Uh, about DNA, that it's like an electrical wire for signaling in the cell. It's all electrical communication. Other mainstream science study found that bees find pollen through electrical signals from flowers. Not sight, not smell, electrical signals. And therefore, um, we are giving off electrical frequencies. And if we're on a state of frustration, we are giving off distorted frequencies and distorting the energetic field around us, including our own. And if we're in a balanced, harmonious state, we're giving off balanced, harmonious um, electrical um, frequencies. And that's why I said earlier, it's at this electrical level that even at the, in the level of politics, left and right, and, and for and against, it's, it's an electrical circuit of, of resistance and mutual empowerment. Uh, so much paranormal, like ghosts and paranormal activity, like uh, lights dimming and uh, uh, musical uh, players turning on and off, um, that is because in other levels of reality, close to this one, that, that also works with electrical and electromagnetic uh, um, energy. And thus, the, the easiest way to affect our reality in a way that's basically making themselves known is through the electrical circuits of houses and electrical circuits of technology. This is why we get um, uh, dimming lights and stuff like that. Now, astrology is another mystery to mainstream science, except that it's not. Um, we live in this quantum field of possibility and probability, and although we see planets and stars, if we saw them on a, a waveform level, they are information fields. And as those information fields are passing through the waveform field of what we call the cosmos, that information is exche being exchanged with the, the cosmic field, which we're interacting with. And when planets are in certain relationships to each other, the impact collectively on the field of their collective information is much greater than if it's just one single planet. This is why these conjunctions and trines and all these things uh, become so powerful. And as the information is being changed in the cosmic field by these uh, astrological changes, astronomical changes, it affects us because we are interacting with that, um, with that field. And the point we enter, the cycle, dictates the energetic field that we take on, the, the astrological field we take on, and therefore we will be affected by changes in the field through our lives in ways that are different, uh, subtly and more, less than subtly, to people who've come in at another uh, point in the cycle, what we call another time of uh, birth. 
Time and space, they are also part of this decoded cosmic internet which do not exist beyond it, which is why near-death experiences don't describe time and space in the same way when they leave the body. Time and space is an illusion as we experience it. We look at the night sky and we think that what we're looking at is billions and billions of miles away. Well, that's where the night sky exists in the form that we're experiencing it. Well, don't look millions of miles away and billions of miles away to me. It's all illusion. So, um, when we decode the energetic field that we are looking at in the night sky, we turn it into a holographic expression of that, and it appears to have time and space, but it doesn't. If you, if you put a, a disk in a computer, what comes on the screen is perspective, space, and as the scenes go from one to the other, time seems to be passing. But it's all on the same disk at the same time. In the same now, it's all an illusion. So, um, if you're watching a movie, the scene you are watching is your present, the scene you've watched is your past, and the ones you haven't watched yet is your future, but all the scenes are on the same disc at the same time. And if I'm watching the movie up there, then I'm in the future of someone watching the movie symbolically further back. It's all illusion, time, everything. There is only one now. There is only the perception of time, not time itself. And beyond time and space, this reality, um, is the now. This is why when people leave the body, they describe this very different relationship to time. But we are in a, a, an illusion of time and space, which is incredibly important to the control system, as I'll come to. Uh, this guy said, the present moment is the only moment available to us, and it is the door to all moments. Um, and people say, well, it can't be just a now. There's a future and there's a past. Okay, well, it's okay. So you're in the now. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I, yeah present. Yeah, okay. Um, when you're thinking about the past, where are you? Uh, in the now. Yeah, okay. So when you're worrying about the future, where are you? Uh, I'm in the now. And when that future comes and you experience it, where are you? Well, I'm in the now. There is only the now. There is only the illusion of past and present. And if, and this is all part of the manipulation too, if you could be pulled from the power of the now into the perception of the past through regret and anger and all that stuff, or um, uh, resentment, or you can be pulled into the future symbolically by worrying about what's coming next and what's going to happen to the kids and how am I going to pay the rent, you're being pulled into illusory states of time and out of the now, which is the only moment we can change anything. Um, and so, um, if that expanded awareness part of us is in a realm of no time now, and we are in the illusion of time, that alone is disconnecting us from the uh, expanded nature of self. Einstein said when, about relativity, when you are courting a nice girl, an hour seems like a second. When you sit on a red-hot cinder, a second seems like an hour. That's relativity because we perceive time by the way we decode information. It's as simple as that. Um, we have such a ludicrous perception of time that if you cross an invisible line in the ocean and go that way or that way, you go into yesterday or tomorrow. And it's not even straight. Not even straight. And we think that is time. It's not. It's a construct. And at a London university, they had this study with sports people who were in sports where things were happening really quickly, like you're waiting for a serve in a tennis match or you're waiting for a pitch in baseball. And what they found is, because you know, you, you watch a tennis match, you're going like that, you're going like that, especially at Wimbledon, you, I've already been there once, but they, you go, he not only hit it, he, he got it in the freaking line. How does he do that? I can't see the bloody ball, it's a blur. What they found is, is when they're waiting to, to receive a serve, they start processing information differently. They start processing it quicker, and to them, the ball, therefore, is not moving as fast as it is for the crowd. It's all an illusion. What do they say about great footballers? He seems to have more time than anyone else. He's decoding information quicker than anyone else, therefore, he appears to have more time. And that's why this near-death experience, so once he left the body, which is decoding this illusion of time, there is no time. 
There is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. And, you know, they say of people like Leonardo da Vinci and Giordano Bruno that they were ahead of their time because they knew so much compared with others of their time. Uh, but they weren't beyond time, uh, or rather they weren't um, ahead of their time. They were beyond time because they were able to connect out of the program into the expanded awareness of inspiration and um, intuitive knowing. And from there, they were able to understand things in this world that other people in this world at the time were not able to. And so um, wherever we've been in the process of what we call history, there have been people who have tapped in to this infinite possibility and potential, and they've said, oh, he was ahead of his time. No, he was beyond time. More importantly, beyond the program. So when I'm talking in part three about some historical things, uh, it, it, that's only a, a, a linear explanation. It, it, it's not quite like that because there's only the now. So then we come to numbers, and this is really leading big time into the end of this section which will um, start to look at this reality in a, from another perspective completely. Numbers, what, what are numbers? Numbers are an expression of the digital construct. When I'm talking about holograms, it's a digital hologram that we are creating and experiencing as this reality. So on one level, it's digital. It's about numbers. This is the level that the... Um, the art of numerology works on this uh, digital level of reality, which was brilliantly uh, portrayed in the Matrix movies. Numbers are digital expressions of frequencies. So if numbers, same numbers keep coming into your life, they're an expression of a frequency that's around you. Um, and this is, um, like I say, this is where holograms are now going they're creating digital holograms. Now that's pretty much getting to where we are in this reality. Um, this is a mainstream report about um, one of them. And they look so real, these digital holograms, so real that when Ford used a digital hologram to show off a car concept model, people stopped, afraid to walk into it. They thought the holographic car was really there. That's a digital hologram of a motorbike, for example. Um, DNA is digital on one level, and the, the, on the uh, digital um, level of on-off electrical charges, they also relate to the AC, G, and T codes of DNA, because each of those codes has a binary value. This is taking us into the realm of the true nature of the reality we are experiencing. I'm heading there fast now. Now, if you look also at numbers, you find in the fabric of our reality recurring numerological codes. One is the Fibonacci sequence, which you can find in all these things, everything from hurricanes to um, the uh, formation of plants, the way waves operate, everything. Um, and the Fibonacci sequence is when you add the previous two numbers to get the third. One and one is two, two and one is three, three and two is five, and so on. And uh, it's named after um, a, a, a mathematician from way back. Now, also, you have symmetrical mathematics uh, where um, smaller versions of something express the bigger version of the same thing, like a, a tree grows in its branches like a tree grows as a whole. That's the holographic principle. That's the holographic world made manifest and called symmetrical mathematics. Same with the lungs. And there's also fractal patterns um, within the fabric of our reality. And a fractal is a never-ending pattern. Fractals are infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales, holographic. They are created by repeating a simple process over and over in an ongoing feedback loop. And like I say, fractal patterns have been found in the fabric of the universe. Um, they are finding that across every expression of this reality, the universe, the brain, the internet, growth patterns, uh, small and large networks, 
and even personal relationships and many other things from a psychological point of view, they are all showing the same growth patterns like, um, a, uh, like, a, like a fractal pattern, like a recurring pattern in which everything reflects everything else, holographic. Fractal patterns are also related to the way DNA works. And here's a, uh, a scientific paper that captures it all in a headline. DNA is a fractal antenna in electromagnetic fields. Uh, which brings us to this. Um, I've been saying now for uh, quite a long time, um, at least around 2002, 3, uh, in my books, that we live in a simulation. And by definition, a simulation is something that had to be created by some intelligence. Um, and what is happening now is more and more mainstream scientists are coming out and saying, actually, it does seem like we live in a simulation. So I'm saying the universe is a simulation. I've been saying it for a long time uh, because the universe is a vast electrical communication system, like I've been describing, because it is a simulation. Just like a, the computer system and the internet system is a vast electrical, electromagnetic, encoded communication system. And like I say, mainstream physicists and scientists are beginning to say, hold on, it does look like that. Physicists may have evidence a universe is a computer simulation. Uh, this is a recurring story you see all the time now. This is a guy called uh, Silas Bean, who led a, a team at uh, the University of Bonn. He also works in, the, in North America, and uh, looking into whether we live in a simulation. And they concluded, actually, it looks like we do. Um, is our universe fake? Physicists claim we could all be the playthings of advanced civilization. Our universe may be a matrix-like computer game designed by aliens, says NASA scientist. And that NASA scientist was, um, or is, a guy called Rich Turrell, director of the Center for Evolutionary Computation and Automated Design at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And this is what he said um, this year. The universe is a digital hologram, what I've been saying in my books for years, and so must have been created by some form of intelligence, which goes without saying. Um, is reality an illusion? Scientists say we may be living in a computer simulation controlled by an evil uh, genius. And this is a uh, guy called Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson. He's a bit of a celebrity scientist in America. Doesn't seem to have the most open mind I've ever seen in the world. But he's saying it's very likely the universe is a simulation. Uh, Elon Musk, the uh, technological uh, uh, guy who funds uh, SpaceX and uh, Tesla cars, etc., we are almost definitely living in a simulation, and he says there's only a one in billions chance that we're not. And if you look at uh, these more advanced computer games, um, like No Man's Sky, um, they use artificial intelligence to self-create an entire cosmos full of planets. Running off 600,000 lines of code, the game creates an artificial galaxy populated by that vast number of unique planets that you can travel to and explore. And the makers of the game say they set the parameters for the game to create itself. And the rules that we set in motion, that we taught the computer, which then ru runs the game on those rules. That is what we call in this simulation the laws of physics. Um, and so the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, said, Biolo biology is fundamentally discrete based on sets of nucleic and amino acids combined into genes and proteins, and computers are fundamentally discrete um, based on bits of data processed by logic gates. The latter have long been used to study the former, but a range of emerging technologies are now making it possible to directly convert between these representations. Just as analog digital and digital analog converters provide the interface between computers and the physical world of sensors and actuators, Biology digital and digital biology converters are allowing computers to create and control biological worlds because the biological is just another form of technological to those that are actually behind all this. Um, and this is the Silas Bean uh, paper and their conclusions at the uh, University of Bonn. They say they may have evidence that the universe is a computer simulation 
they pointed out that in a paper called Constraints on the Universe as a Numerical Stim Simulation, that simply being a simulation would create its own laws of physics that would limit possibility. Scientists talk about a phenomenon known as the GZK cutoff, which is an apparent boundary for cosmic ray particles caused by interaction with cosmic background radiation. The University of Bonn paper says that this pattern of constraint mirrors what you would find with a computer simulation. They say that like a prisoner in a pitch black cell, we would not be able to see the walls of our prison. And this is James Gates, an American uh, theoretical physicist who was a science advisor to uh, Barack Obama. And this is his findings reported in Physics World. There may be evidence to show that our reality is a simulation akin to, uh, akin to the movie The Matrix. Gates and his team of researchers have discovered equations in the fabric of the universe that contain embodied or embedded codes um, of digital data, computer codes. They say the form of one and zero, the uh, binary system of on-off electrical charges used by computers, and he says, we have no idea what they are doing there. Computers and other electrical technology are embedded with a mathematical sequence known as error correcting codes or block codes, which return data to its original state if something changes or interferes with it during transmission. Gates and his team have found these sequences within the fabric of our reality, but they don't know what they are doing there. He was then asked, have you found a set of equations indistinguishable from those that drive search engines and browsers? And his reply was, that is correct. And the physics of computer games, as I say, they're starting to mirror our reality, mirror those of the reality we're experiencing. Um, this is uh, Max Tegmark, physicist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and author of a book called Our Mathematical Universe. He says, the universe can be entirely described by numbers and maths, on that digital level of it, that is, just as a video game is encoded. The physics of computer games and our world are basically the same. Suppose you are a character in Minecraft or some uh, much more advanced computer game where the graphics are really good and you don't think you're in a game. You feel that you can bump into real objects and you can fall in love and get excited about stuff. And when you start studying the physical world in this video game, eventually you start discovering that, whoa, everything is made out of pixels. And all these things that I used to think were stuff are actually just described by a bunch of numbers. You'd undoubtedly be criticized by some friends saying, come on, you're stupid, it's stuff after all. But someone looking from outside of this video game would say that actually all there was was numbers. And we're exactly in this situation in our world. We look around and it doesn't seem that mathematical at all. But everything we see is made out of elementary particles like quarks and electrons. And what uh, we're back to the, um, the, 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 the lighted candle here. And what properties does an electron have? Does it have a smell or a color or a texture? No. We physicists have come up with geeky names for electron properties like electric charge or spin or lepton number, but the electron doesn't care what we call it. The properties are just numbers. And if you look at Minecraft and these games, again, they seem to be seamless moving pictures. What they are is just information pixels that we decode. Um, so is television moving pictures. It's pixels that we decode. Same with LED screens in the same basic principle. And what they found at one level in the fabric of human reality is it looks like pixels. And so what I'm saying is that these uh, codes, these numerological, numerological and geometrical codes that are found in our uh, energetic construct of this reality, I'm saying pi and Fibonacci numbers are computer codes. Those number sequences recur and recur and recur and recur everywhere because there are, they are computer codes. Fractal patterns are computer codes. The genetic code is a computer code. 
as part of this simulation. You look at things like hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, iron on one level, they look like barcodes. Um, and so when we look at the, uh, what we call the heavens, we see it in one way in the holographic decoded uh, perception, but it's an information matrix. On another level, it, it looks something like that. Information being communicated. It's the cosmic internet which we are interacting with. And when I say we, the body's interacting with it, or the waveform level, the body's interacting with it, but what's experiencing it is not the body, that's just a vehicle, it's the I, our awareness. And things get very strange when we get close to the speed of light. And I'm saying that one level of this matrix, this simulation, is what we call the speed of light. And that's why it gets very strange. We decode information and things appear to be very weird when we get close to the speed of light because they are the frequency walls or at least one level of this simulation. So like um, the Bond team said, like a prisoner in a pitch black cell, we may never be able to see the walls of our prison because we are the way we decode reality. And what is stopping us seeing those walls? Because we can. When you do that, you can start to perceive it. What's stopping us seeing it is the postage stamp consensus, which is holding us here. While we're here, and that's what the program's there to do, to hold us here, we'll never understand the nature of what we're experiencing and how it is being used to control us. The intellect operates in five sense reality. And the intellect is a prison without expanded awareness. Intellect is a useful servant, but a terrible master. And for most, it's a master, not a servant. This is the isolated intellect. This is the isolated intellect without the expression of consciousness. And that's why the world is as it is. And that is basically the institutions of the world telling us what we should believe and should not believe. So the education system, yippee, we know about the known. It's all about the known. Holding within the known. All postage stamp, yeah, no, it's all about the known, education. But not expanding awareness so we understand the unknown. And so we go through life and the postage stamp consensus is pushing us down the channels of the maze uh, in a way that we never get out. We're living a lie with a mask on, we, I call phantom self. Um, I am. You are, all these decisions and perceptions I'm going to be are coming from, uh, it is, it isn't, from this illusion. We're all just being normal. Um, I know exactly who I am. No, you don't. And so, how many people in this room would have experienced this? It's not like you think it is. You're mad, mate. Because, and it's no good saying, you know, you're stupid and all that stuff. It literally can't compute because the program has him. Control perception and you control reality. And you control perception by controlling belief. This system doesn't care what you believe so long as you believe it rigidly to the exclusion of all other possibility. Because then they got you. Accidents happen, that's what everyone says. But in a quantum universe, there's no such things as accidents. Only possibilities and probabilities folded into existence by perception. Control that, control the world. We see things not as they are, but as we are, exactly, because that is what dictates the feedback loop of perception to experience, to ex perception to experience. Change perception, change experience. You know, if people just had a, uh, in fact, we've had some posters uh, uh, done for this. Just a little poster on the wall saying, change perception, change your life. Because it's that simple. Change perception, change your life because you change the way you interact with the cosmic internet and thus what you experience. That is how we got here and we need to break out of it. Because if we're looking down at the world, down a microscope, how are we gonna see anything? When you're looking through a telescope, looking down the wrong end, how are we gonna see anything? You can only see dots, you can't see pictures. I am, uh, is all you can see. But you wake up by removing the program, and suddenly the world looks very, very different. Now, symbolically, you're above the maze. Suddenly you can see it. You can see what you've been in all your life. So that's what's been happening. 
Those who danced were thought to be quite insane by those who could not hear the music. T'was always so, because those who can hear the music dance to the music, and those who can't hear the music think you're dancing to silence. So you're mad. And here's a sobering thought. Those that control this world, the institutions that control this world, the politicians, the doctors, the scientists, the education system, the academics, they are almost in their entirety people who cannot hear the music. And that is why the world is a madhouse. And why those who can hear the music, and more and more can, have the duty, have the opportunity to change this world in ways that those that can't hear the music have no chance of understanding yet. But. <laughs> this, is, this is simply not hearing the music, only hearing the program. And uh, this is not new. This is Jonathan Swift. He died in 1745. And he said, when a true genius appears, you can know him by this sign that all the dunces are in a confederacy against him because of what I've just explained. Socrates, wisdom is knowing how little we know. If we just realize that and have some humility, we don't know it all. We cannot know it all in the situation we're in. So open our minds, not to believe anything and everything, but to give it a chance to justify its place in our perceptions, which the program is trying to shut out. So that's the next stage of the rabbit hole. Reality is an illusion. And the next part, I'm going to start in half an hour with this. Um, so who is behind it all? Who is the spider? Thank you very much. Thank you.